on, behalf, on behalf of the audience. Uh, I love lightning talks. Five minutes to say whatever you want. Um, I'm usually a nice guy, but in this context, I'm going to be a ruthless jerk, just warning you. Uh, I'm going to lean on my phone in the sense of you get, you get five minutes, and that's it. When the buzzer goes off, I'm sorry. Laptop's down. And speaking of laptops, um, some lightning talks places, they make you just all present off of one lightning talk because we want it to go fast. Um, but everyone has their own different laptops. So I am going to tolerate different laptops. But when you plug in, you have maybe 30 seconds. If it's not really working, sorry, back the line to you. You get one more chance at the end. If that doesn't still work, I'm sorry. You then have the option maybe to just gesticulate wildly without your laptop. If that doesn't work, I'm sorry. Let's go to, go to the bar afterwards. So just warning you, technical dif difficulties, I will not tolerate them. Go five minutes and one second will also, I will not tolerate that. Otherwise that, after the, afterwards, I'm a totally nice guy. So with that said, we're gonna do one, mostly we're gonna go in order from sign-ups, except for the first one. We've got Peter Martinez, did, did yes. I pronounce that right? That's fine. Uh, how do you pronounce it? Martinez. Martinez. oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sorry that's your name, but I'm sorry I mispronounced it. Uh, and your talk is AUT Executions. Yes. Ready, are you ready? Yes. Hello Set. everybody. Go. So my name is Peter Martinek. I'm a test engineer lead at Concur Technologies. And my main team's responsibility is to execute a test. And I came to this presentation because what we talk about here is the development, right? We still talk about how to develop. But without a good strategy for the executions, the develop tests are for nothing, right? So we need to think about how we, how we execute. <coughs> Some small agenda, we need to be quick. I have those four minutes already only. <laughs> I will give you some quick background. I will show you some old numbers because I don't have a new ones now. And I will a little bit try to summarize what's good to consider if you want to have nice executions. <laughs> so a little bit of the background. We have a monthly release in our company. Also we, we, are, we are able to push out hotfixes every day if, if it's needed. We have a new code to test every day deployed into our internal QA environments. We are in the process of conversion from Selenium 1 to Selenium 2, and we do use Selenium for functional testing. So, numbers, I love this chart. It's old, but I love it. It shows you <coughs> the correlation between as many tests you execute, the more defects you find, you can see. And we started with those daily executions two years ago, and we were executing around 500 test cases per month. What we have now already, we are doing around 16,000 or almost 17,000 test suites per month, which might equal to 350,000 test scripts executed per the release cycle. And those are big numbers. And it's not just that you develop new tests, you add them and you execute them. It's not so simple. You need to consider a lot of things. But I, I, I believe that when you guys see it, you are like, that's cool, now I will execute all my tests, all of them. <laughs> but then you realize, how? And I see your faces. <laughs> hmm. There are few things you should consider if you really have a proper automation execution. You should automate your reporting, and you should advertise yourself within the organization. So if you have a, just a 20 test that you execute on a daily basis, create your report and send it to everybody all the days. And this also helps you to make the developers looking there. And because I like you, I will give you one tip. Nobody wants to read the reports. But if you put a small comic strip at the end, people actually start to like it, right? You can put there something simple like Dilbert comic. It's great. <laughs> I, once I forget to put a Dilbert comic there, I had like 20 emails the second day, and people were stopping me on the hallway. Hey, man, where is the Dilbert? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's pretty cool. Second thing, second point, packaging and scheduling. This is very important. You should develop a functionality that you can group your tests, and the scheduling, you can say, hey, execute me the test at 1 o'clock, and execute me the test at 3 o'clock. And you can go further. You can make it dynamic. You can say, Execute a test 50 minutes after my code was built and deployed. And execute this package 100 minutes after my code was built and deployed, right? Because you don't want people sitting and pressing the run button and waiting until it's finished. Third thing is build validity. You should really consider 
using your environment like the, for the fuel potential. So if I deploy twice a day, I should really run those tests for the 12 hours, the build is valid. It's not like you should run the tests only for two hours a day. It's good to use the full time frame. <coughs> you should think about making your tests intelligent. And mostly if you have an application that is dependent on the third party systems, it's very important and you shouldn't be afraid to even put <laughs> Intelligent test. You can, you can grab me after I will finish my speech and I'm very happy to speak with you about it, right? Modularity. But this is something that was said uh, many times here. Make your test to small modules. Don't be afraid to introduce the dependencies. 30 minute tests just can't work. You must track your failure reasons. You need to know why the tests are failing. It's not that we have only synchronization issues. There might be wrong build and those things. So really track those things and constantly review the value you receive from running the test. If you don't find the bugs with the test for one month, just don't run it. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was on time, no? That's no fair. Ten, nine, I'm just going to let it run away. <laughs> Thank you. What Thanks. key success we'll do the mic. avoided listening to? <laughs> Two, one, there, good job. <laughs> so what should I yeah, do with this? Uh, Mike Levin, uh, bunk monitor, monitor, you say it. Okay, so where should I put it? I'll let you say it and then I'll start the clock. The name of your top. Functional monitorings. There you go, ready? Yeah. Oh, oh, hey, I, I've got sign, so I'm going to sit like somewhere and raise at like we got four minutes left, three, two, one, probably 30 seconds, and then that's it. So look for me like there. Great. Great. Ready, set, go. Okay. Hi, my, my name is Mike Levin. I'm from Yandex, and I'd like to share with you the concept of functional monitorings we use internally in, in, our, in our company. So everyone has uh, test use, which we run uh, regularly in testing, uh, and uh, we wonder, can this test find any new issues if, if we run th uh, this test in production? And we think yes, and we think there are four cases when it's reasonable to run your tests in production. First of them is testing in production environment itself. So you test everything in testing, and you push it to production, and it could be reasonable to run your test again just to, uh, to be sure it's, everything works co correctly in the different environment. It's uh, just to be mentioned, but it's not a functional monitoring itself. The second is more interesting, data corruption. Your web, ser web service probably relies on some data providers. For example, you can get some news, weather, stock exchange, timetables, and so forth. Even sometimes your web server can rely on, on some data that uh, uh, appeared from another your service. So in this case, uh, you can either rely completely on your data provider, or you can monitor them. We choose to monitor, and we run our tests in production regularly that check that there are exact blocks with exact, for example, it's, it's news. There are five strings and alphanumerical symbols in every region. We run it every five minutes, and so we have a possibility to uh, notify fast our team, uh, force our data providers to fix it, and so forth. Third is human flaws. Every one of us is a human being, our engineers, our system engineers, everybody. They can make mistakes. They can push some code to production mistakenly. They can uh, mistakenly set up your web server so it shows splash screen instead of your web server. So it's better to monitor in some uh, critical passes through your web server so uh, you will be able to notify fast your team that something went wrong and they will fix, fix it fast. And the fourth is hardware and how it affects hardware problems and how it affects functionality. So it's obvious that your tests can find some new issues uh, can find issues uh, related to the hardware. If something went wrong and the database is in read-only mode and nothing c can be done with your application, so in this case your test will fail. But it's, you can say that your hardware engineers had their own monitorings for that. But sometimes it's not that obvious uh, how hardware re uh, reflects in the, in the end user functionality. So in this case it's uh, useful to have your monitorings uh, to let your team know how it really works when something went wrong in hardware, how it really works for users. So what is a functional monitoring? 
it's functional test running in regu running regularly in production, and it's also a reliable notification with email, SMS, and so on. What means reliable? Reliable is two things. So first, it's no false alarms. Your test should uh, should not produce false alarms because your system engineers hates to wake up in the middle of the night because of your uh, monitoring mistakes. So you better aggregate results from your tests and filter them somehow in case, for example, like three in a row, if three in a row fails, then you send the message. And the second thing about reliable is that your system monitor, your hardware, your, sorry, your software monitorings, functional monitorings, should be as reliable as the software you monitor. Because if it's not so, then it could, it could happen so that your monitorings fail first and no notification will be sent about the problem. So, how it works for us. First, you need somehow, some, some kind of continuous integration to run your tests regularly. Second, you need to have some piece of code that will collect data from your tests and send to the results aggregator. Uh, for this uh, piece of code, we use JUnit, so we use r special rules for collecting data and send to the aggregator. Then you need a, need a result aggregator that will collect data and uh, uh, based on some rules, aggregate it and send notifications only when it's reasonable, only when you're sure. For example, three in a row fails, then send. Uh, and uh, for, for this purpose, we used to use our own uh, piece of code. Now we switch into the Apache Camel, which is uh, quite nice. Uh, so, uh, all this stuff will finally send notifications, and that's it, functional monitoring that help your team. Thank you very much. I'm Mike Levin, and that's it. How do you pronounce your last name? Quayar. Quayar. Dan Quayar. I'll just let you. Oh, this is the the uh, buzz, the uh, the iOS stuff, right? Yes. Ready? Uh, let me open PowerPoint. Set. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hopefully PowerPoint works. All right. Where's the play button? Where is it? There it is. This is really low risk. Um. All right. I'm ready. I'm not on the screen. Um, I'll be nice. Ten. <laughs> oh, I need to plug it in. <laughs> Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Could someone hold this in? There three. Two. One. Ready. Right. Go. Start. All right. I'm here to talk about the native app driver for iOS. So you'll see things like iPhone driver that can automate like a web UI view or whatever within an app. But no good application writer for iOS just makes a web view in there app, and that's their app. I'm calling you out Facebook, wherever you are. You should use real Coco controls, um, like a lot of people do. So anyways, my solution requires zero code to be added to the application under test. It uh, uses Apple's existing iOS JavaScript UI automation framework, so it's already supported and it works. The pros are it adds real-time control through a bit of hacky magic that I won't go into here, but you will see when I release the code. Uh, allows users to run cross-client tests using both browsers and iOS device, so combining Selenium with this. And it's likely portable to Android and Windows Phone, though I haven't done it yet. Uh, so some more pros. Uh, developers can add uh, ID-like element identification using the accessibility APIs in iOS. And any of the information from the instruments in instruments can be used in these tests, like screenshots, CPU usage, memory leaks, call stacks, crashes. A few dozen other things you can write your own. It's all good. And then the only con is that there's a performance bug in Apple's automation suite with this one function that I use a lot. And so you need to batch commands together to make them run fast. So. That's all the talking I'm going to do. If you want to email me, it's just d at zeus.com. Oh, by the way, I'm Dan Quayar. I am the, I lead the QA department at Zeus. I manage all the manual and automated testers. Um, so, now that we have this closed, let's just see a demo. So I'm going to start with the video. Here's an example of the cross-client automation. Let's full screen it. Uh, so here we have Selenium controlling, it looks like Firefox, and we have my thing controlling the iPhone. And so here we made an account using our API. And we're just verifying that on both our clients, we can sign in with it. So you can see it integrates pretty seamlessly right into our existing Selenium tests. And I will show you a little bit what that code looks like. Uh, yeah, let's kill quick time. Uh, so let's go to the code. Uh -huh. 
And you'll see that, oh, doesn't this look a whole lot like Selenium? Uh, it's just you have tap instead of click, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the nice thing is, I'll show you, Apple has basically already given us Selenium IDE for us built into Xcode. Uh, where's Xcode? That's not Xcode. Uh, so you can see it looks a lot like Selenium code. You can look at the different hooks for stuff. Uh, oh, this tab bar isn't as big as it was on mine. Uh, where's one I can look at? Blah, blah. So if you look here, these are, uh, let's see, is this the one I want to look at? Is the other one? No, that's one that looks bad. You can put accessibility like IDs in there. So you can see here for this login button, we just put login in our iOS app and we're able to access it that way. Done with Mono now. Uh, let's go to here. And I will show you how you can use instruments as Selenium IDE to sort of record. I use it mainly just to get the hooks into things when I don't add them myself. But uh, it's already built in for you, which is really nice. Hopefully this compilation doesn't take too long. How much? Two minutes? OK. Stupid compiler. Uh, I guess while that's going, well, I better not while that's going. I'm going to slow down even more. Um, so yeah, you can just walk around and click through the app as much as you can. ID. I wonder where they got the idea. They probably came to this conference. All right. Here we go. So here's instruments. If you've never used it, it's a profiling tool for, uh, for any Xcode or any Objective-C app, I'll just say. And it just boots your app in here. And oh, this is really low res. This isn't going to work very well. Um, so then we would go to add new script, blah, 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 blah. Hit record. And now, thanks. Are we recording now? You can see that I just clicked the cancel button, and it gave me the different hook for it. All right, so that's sort of the Selenium IDE functionality. And then lastly, I will show you the mother of all the tests, if I can get it to. I'm just going to do the movie, because I don't trust me to run it in time. So here is a really crazy test we wrote, which tests the entire edit profile scenario on Zoom. So editing the date card, as we call it. Uh, let's full screen this. One minute. Yeah, this video isn't a minute long. So this is sort of the stuff we've been able to do with it. We haven't, the only thing, we've, we found one or two controls that have been difficult to automate, but it didn't take us very long to, what's this? Let me fast forward. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so you can see we can log into the Zeus dating iPad app here, and we can get through it. And here we're just going to generate random profile info using functions already in our Selenium automation. And we're going to input it into this form. And so all you're really waiting for here is all these actions to finish, all the drawing to finish. But the framework's actually pretty fast. 30 seconds. So with my last 30 seconds, I would like anyone interested in this to send me an email at d at zeus.com. And let's get this rolling, and let's get this integrated somewhere so everyone can use it. It's really easy to use. It's ready to go, pretty much. I've got the green light to open source it. So that's all I have. That was awesome. Thanks. Um, everyone in the future reference uh, future conferences, and today, although it's probably too late for whoever's left, video demos. Totally pro, totally awesome, highly recommend it. That's how you do it. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. Um, next is Anand and, oh, Kamal. Uh, how to do it wrong. Tell me how to pronounce everyone's names before you go up. I apologize. I didn't get it. Um, testing Geeks, how to do it wrong? Question mark? Yeah. So because we have been talking about hey. how to do Ready, it. Ready, set, go. Yeah. <laughs> We have been talking about how to do it in the right way from like day one, so we thought we'll just do a little bit differently and say how to do it in the wrong way. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, so, uh, so first of all, I think my voice is enough. First of all, I would like to add this disclaimer. Uh, this in action is a highly work of fiction. Uh, any resemblance to any person, living or dead, is highly coincidental. So once upon a time, in a far, far away land, there was a company called the Best Practices Company, and there were two roles there. One was the best practices metrics manager, and then the other was a tester. So this in action goes away. Uh, so role, I'm the best practices metric manager. I'm just a Hello, tester. tester. Uh, I've been dreaming about automation, and I have been thinking about it from the past three years. Do you think is that enough? Yeah, you're making good progress. You were dreaming about it. Now you've started thinking about it. Yeah. Maybe next step would be to evaluate it. Well, that sounds like a brilliant idea. I'm really going to get a, organize a, a committee to evaluate a highly expensive tool. We don't want to think about any rule, which is any tool, something called Selenium, Selenium or open source. But we want to invest some money so that we can have budget for it, uh, have a highly uh, influential people in the management in the committee who don't know about automation, but they can decide on a tool, and then we can have someone to blame if anything goes wrong. How does that sound to you? Brilliant idea. 
So if we would have someone to blame, then we can write automation in any way we want. Yes, that's the way to go and that's the spirit. We can go, record and play back. Do you think that's it? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was just thinking that I'll just do some kind of uh, record and playback. Yeah, and don't even think about going for scripting because you're a tester, not a developer, okay? Hold your horses. And don't even worry about false positives and or false negatives. We want all our tests to look green. See, I love green. I love the green color. And do you expect your test to find defects? Uh, I'm not sure. No, 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 no. Don't think about finding defects. We just have three minutes. Uh, because I have a manual testing team to give me confidence for that. I'm just having automation so that it, I'm, I'm going to good look to the outside world and the management is happy with my automation team. But just bear in mind, I've heard that record and playback scripts are not easy to maintain. Hello, hello, hello. We are talking about more mortgage driven development here. MDD. <laughs> Don't ever forget that. Okay. So, how do you think we would execute it? Would it be good enough if I just hack it and uh, make it green on my machine? Well, that's brilliant. That's what we want. And make it green on your machine. And don't forget to make it green on my machine. And don't even think about any kind of data checks. As long as it goes and checks all your pages, that's fine. No checking anything in data working uh, correctly or no profiling telling you. No profiling at all. Works for me. Okay. That's good. What about devs? Would you expect me to talk to devs, have any kind of Come collaboration? Come on, now please. We, we are not going to talk to devs. I don't want to blow my budget because now you're going to dev take their time, in, invest time in uh, your design analysis, write some frenzy automation frameworks. Do you think you're going to add value to it? No, I don't think so. What you're going to do is just take devs time, invest their time in automation and in their testing activity, which they're not supposed to do anyways, then I'll have to seek approval from the management and have to uh, get a budget approved for it. No, 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 we don't I want heard, to get that. I heard, I heard someone telling me that if you have design insight of how app is working and if you know about architecture you might find useful defects okay tell me one thing when you send an email through google do you even want to know how google works no not really then why do you want to know why how your application works you're a tester just think about that you're and right. make it sure it just works in your environment don't even go about thinking of checking in an integration environment hold your horses on that okay fine if you say so and so, how should I report? Well, haven't you heard about reporting tests in an Excel sheet? No, no. What no. I want is, whatever tests you execute, just put them down in Excel sheet, mark the status as passed. Okay. Remember, it should always show green. I love green. And then send a report to me in an Excel sheet every day so that I can forward it on to the management. And don't ever think about integrating it with any CI server like Jenkins. I've heard that they are very, very visible and we don't want to enforce visibility because then there'll be questions being raised and then my team is going to look bad if they go red. So I don't want that. I want status in a Excel sheet all marked as green. Fine. So I'll do as you say. Wow. Just like my dream. All the tests executed. Marked green, no database check, all the database configuration done manually. State is reported in an Excel sheet, marked green. I think that's a perfect start and that's what I dreamt for. Thank you. That's a hard break of friendly. Next one is Aaron Mez... Mez ah. I forgot how to pronounce it. Misery. Misery. How long did you think it was going to take before I realized I should just put this over here? Probably sometime tomorrow. You see that 10 seconds? You just got that for free. Five, four, three, two, one, and a half. <laughs> Carry the one, conversion to metric. There we go. Ready, set, go. Okay, so uh, my name is Aram Seri. Uh, I work at Google, and I've been working uh, quite a bit on the native events code. And I'm going to talk about why it's so complicated. And of course, I'm going to start with why do you care about it? So first of all, for those of you who don't know, native events is uh, one of the selling two features where uh, user input is sent as OS events to the browser rather than uh, emulating these events in JavaScript. For the browser, it means um, there's no difference between a user sitting on the computer doing these actions and Selenium sending these uh, comments. 
which means you get pretty accurate user emulation. Uh, things like uh, CSS styles that get applied when a mouse hovers over a specific element, that's the, the only way to get it right. If you, have, uh, if you want to test drag and drop, and um, you want to make sure that no element in the middle between where you drag and where you start dragging and where you end, dra end your drag um, interrupts, that's the only way to do it uh, properly. Uh, but unfortunately, this feature has some sort of uh, compound complexity. First of all, the implementation is relatively hard to understand. And then the implications are also unexpected for uh, a lot of users, especially those who've been using uh, Selenium for uh, quite a while. You have to keep in mind that the web level API is synchronous. We say that and we mean it. And if you think it's not, because in your experience it wasn't, then you may, you're probably wrong. And this means that um, the things like uh, clicking, they return when you expect. but um, with native events, they may return earlier, and you will not see the effects of a click in the page. Uh, this hooks, hooks into the biases, like Liz mentioned yesterday. People have a bias that um, they give instructions to a test as they would give it to a person, especially the, uh, an end-to-end -end test. So they would expect that the person, who, well, when you tell them to click something, they will wait until something will happen and something will finish happening before they do the next step. Not so with, uh, with WebDriver. Um, and the other thing you have to keep in mind is, is that it is about accurate user emulation. Sometimes people um, come to me and say, I've tried clicking an element, I have this element, I tried clicking on, clicking on it, but when I turn on native events, it clicks another element. What happened? That other element is actually hiding the element I'm trying to click. So with synthetic events, yeah, sure, it works, but the user w wouldn't be able to click on that element because something else is hiding it. Um, so what are the implications um, that I've mentioned? Some of them is like, when you, so when you do click, uh, the, the call from click may uh, return before all the actions on the page finished happening, especially if you have lots of Ajax, if you're doing an RPC call. Uh, if you're clicking on, ele on, on an element in order to focus it and type into it, and you have a handle that on the focus clears the element, the text inside, the, the default text inside the element may not be cleared when the click call returns. Navigation, if you click on an element in order to, again, navigate somewhere else, uh, or there is some sequence of actions that ultimately causes the, drive, the browser to switch onto a different page. That will also um, that may also happen before, also after um, the call returns. And the typing again, type stuff and you check if it's in the element, and you expect it to be in the element. Typing may not have been may not have finished um, when you when you uh, when the call returns. What are the other ends that you should know about, um, about native events? Also, dragging and dropping on Windows um, doesn't work properly. It's like it's a known issue with um, requiring a significant amount of effort to fix. And native events on uh, Linux, which was a question that was uh, raised yesterday, it works. It is, um, it is reliable. There were some problems with Windows switching and native events, which um, caused Firefox to misbehave. And that should be fixed with um, test mode um, in the focus, the yeah, test mode of the focus manager in Firefox 12. This is, this is a good example where, uh, by working with browser vendors, we can get things more reliably and more accurately for users. And that's all I have. If you have questions about why is it important, why is the implementation so complex, I can talk for hours about why the implementation is so complex. Uh, but it would be wouldn't be of interest to most of you. Uh, then uh, come and find me. Thank you. everybody. You guys are too well trained. I'm going to stop giving you warnings. Next we have Rajiv Jain talking about Craft and Krypton. Great. Thanks. I'm set. You're good? Yes, I'm good. All right, guys. Selenium conference. Hey, hey, ready, set, go. Okay. Everybody at the Selenium conference, where's the next element after Selenium in the periodic table? Bromine. Bromine. What's the element after that? Ah. Krypton. How many of you heard about the Krypton framework? How many heard about the Krypton framework? Very few. How many attended my talk? Craft and Krypton. Thank you for attending. How many attended the Padlo's talk on security? Yeah. That was tough competition. That was really tough. No worries. No worries. When is the next conference of Selenium? Next year. Next year? April? I got a year. No worries. No worries. I'm getting better in every way. 
Every day. I'm getting better. In every day. Every day. I'm handsome. People like me. Next year, we will have ten times the crowd and half will attend my uh, uh, talk. Thank you to Ashley, who's done a great job. I know it's very hard, but I just wanted to say that, and uh, that's it. You have all the time back to the other people. All right. Record. All right, uh, Peter went first, so now we have Mike Davis migrating from Selenium 1 to Selenium 2. Ready, set. <laughs> How to make it exciting, no one's going over, so, you know. I'm going to have to remove the whole 10-second grace period. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to start. Ready, set, go. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> right, okay. So, something I expected to be sort of a hot topic here. Um, um, maybe I wasn't talking to the right people or in the right circles. Or maybe you've all talked, to, talked about it to death and I just missed it. And sorry if that's the case. But it was migrating from Selenium 1 to Selenium 2. So, I thought I'd very quickly share my experiences of moving from... So, one of the things we do, and um, one of the things I've done in making really, really good tests, is that we've been uh, helping people to move from Selenium 1 to Selenium 2. Uh, oh, yeah, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm on Twitter. It seems that's the hot thing to be doing, so I've resurrected my Twitter account, which hasn't been used since the last conference I attended. Uh, but if people, if people add me, I might get more than 10 followers, and then I might even tweet something. Um, yeah, so why switch? So, to be honest, we went fast. Like, what difference is it going to make? It's a huge amount of effort, and you just end up in the same place, right? Uh, but then we came across this sort of fairly major and a somewhat unique factor which sort of influenced our decision. It's uh, <laughs> having Simon sat two rows behind you asking you every day, have you moved yet? Have you moved yet? Is a sort of reason in its own to switch. Um, but of course, you may not be fortunate or unfortunate enough to have Simon at your side the whole time. Um, so why else might you switch? Uh, first of all, there's a much, much cleaner API. Um, so there's, there's the simple things like having set timeout, which takes a string. Um, having, like, when I look, the Selenium interface has 114 methods um, that you can call. Like, um, it's really nice. Like, in moving, a uh, moving our tests across, we saw like, significant number of lines of code being dropped. And it's really nice when you take like, a, a six or seven line method, which is hacking around something that Selenium couldn't do because of the sandbox and that sort of thing, um, to take that and make it into a single web driver call. Um, so, yeah, that's the first reason. The second reason is that, as was mentioned earlier, WebDriver has all the momentum. It has all the really nice new features, the weight APIs, the uh, complex interactions, maybe some HTML5 stuff coming. Um, so how do we actually go about migrating? The first option, like migrating is hard, we could try and write a script. Uh, I suspect it wouldn't be too difficult to write a script that converted everything. The problem is that if we do that, we're going to lose all the really nice um, improved APIs and all that sort of thing. So I've been against that as an option. The second option is sort of a silver bullet, but more sort of Acme rocket, is the web driver back Selenium. That's come on a long way recently, which is, um, which is really good. And if it works, it's a really good first step. So on my latest project that we did, uh, we turned it on and everything just worked, which is remarkable. Um, if, if it's really simple to do, then that's a really good option. But it still doesn't really give you the API, right? If you want the API, you've got two options. Um, either you migrate all the tests or you delete all the tests. I don't think it's really necessary to delete them and start again. It's really not that difficult to migrate. And what we found is the important thing is that when we migrated, it wasn't just the migration. It was also like actually moving to WebDriver 2 and that API wasn't the or Selenium 2, wasn't the main thing. Actually, by going through all our tests, your tests have evolved over time, right? It gives you a chance to go back to your original tests and bring them up to the same standard as even your latest tests. Um, in addition to that, you can go through all those to-dos with bugs that have been fixed years ago, and you can actually just go and do those to-dos now because like, nobody actually went and fixed all those to-dos, whereas now you can just go and delete all the workarounds because the devs hadn't finished finishing some feature, and now they've done, and that's been gone, so you can go and clean up all those to-dos at the same time. It's a really good excuse to go through all your tests and to actually give them like, a bit of a spring clean along the way. So the way we went about doing this, we first of all created two test suites, a web driver and a Selenium one, so we created all the infrastructure to go about giving you a web driver instance instead of a Selenium instance and that sort of thing. Then we started with like, the smallest test, 
So we went about, found the ones which have the least page objects, or the page objects that touch the least number of tests, and started by moving those, and then we went about it sort of a page object at a time. You may have to duplicate some at the start, like probably all your tests use the home page, so you may end up having a period where you have like two home page objects, a, a web drive implementation of Selenium. Um, but yeah, it's, you can just, that's what we did, you just have to bite the bullet and go through them, but it's really quite a mechanical process, and where it isn't mechanical, it's normally because you've got some hideous thing that you can now replace with just a single line of code. And then it's really important that you don't stop halfway through or you're going to end up in a real mess. So if you're going to start the process, you should try and make sure you get to the end. Oh, and also you should fix up all the page objects in the middle, like we said yesterday, which is that if you have all these web driver, uh, if you expose web driver into your test case, it's a lot harder. If you make sure that all of it's caught up in the, everything's, 10 seconds, everything should be in your page objects, nothing in the page objects, and it's a lot easier to migrate. You just migrate the page objects and don't touch the tests. In fact, you shouldn't change any test code as part of the migration. Thank you. All right, next we're going to have a talk on BHAT. I see my company's name on there, so be careful of the whole, yeah. No vendor talks, right? OK, so awkward. Ready? Set. I just realized we actually have some time until the closing uh, emitters thing, so we should maybe, we should have given everyone an extra minute across the board, but anyway. Well, I'll just have an extra break. Well, we could just, yeah, have an extra break, but just let one person talk for 20 minutes. Who, who? Should pull the coin? No, no. <laughs> could never waffle on forever. <laughs> never. I'll, I'll, Right. Why am I being nice to him uh, and not everybody else? Try unplugging it and plugging it back in again. Right. And then if that doesn't work, we'll swap for David. Where's David? Stark. Right. Ready, set, go. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Shashi. Uh, I work for a company called iBuildings uh, in central London. So we basically PHP specialized company. So today I'm going to talk about the BHAT. So the BHAT is the basically behavior driven development framework for PHP applications. So I just realized that the people uh, from all across the world didn't know about the, what is the behavior driven development and something like that because the, this term coined in UK and most of the companies in UK are doing that, following the practices and uh, adopting them. But the people uh, all across the world is just like uh, they have no idea about BDD, but uh, it's good to uh, read some blog posts about that, uh, by Dan North, read Matt's blog or Leeds' blog, or just read a Cucumber book. So uh, what is BHAT? BHAT is like a BDD framework for PHP applications. Uh, it works exactly as the same way uh, as a Cucumber works. So. Whatever stuff you can do with uh, Selenium and Cucumber, that's exactly happening with the BHAT, with the Selenium 1, as well as WebDriver. So BHAT can be used for functional testing as well as the acceptance testing. So you can write your feature files in Gherkin language uh, right from the sprint planning. Uh, then wait for a developer to implement the code. Uh, and then when it comes back to you, they just write some step definitions using Mink. So Mink is the web acceptance, uh, web acceptance testing framework for the PHP applications that launched the Selenium web driver or there are some headless browser as well like uh, Goat or uh, Zombie, Phantom.js maybe also supported. Uh, yeah, once we got the feature files ready and you just, you just run behat command again and just you can see the browser launch and test running in the browser. Uh, right. Uh, I got I got some uh, uh, code written in a blog post. You can if you read the blog post, it's uh, uh, told you about how to get started with BHAT, implement some code and st uh, step definitions how you can use uh, ANT for plugging into the continuous integration server like Jenkins. So yeah, uh, if you plug it in a continuous integration server, then you can run your tests uh, uh, in a dedicated server or uh, on Source Labs. So we use Source Labs for running our tests, and that works like a charm. Uh, 
we got uh, two builds, like one is for acceptance testing and an another for functional testing. So we're still using a uh, Selenium PHP unit for running our functional tests and oh, we scheduled overnight build. Uh, in terms of behead build, that's a quick feedback build. Uh, we run it uh, after, we used to run it after every commit, but uh, due to the uh, increased consideration of the large commit, we just we just reduced it to running uh, <coughs> twice a day. Uh, well, in terms of the continuous integration, uh, uh, it shows the really nice report uh, as seen here. Everyone can read it, given I'm on this page, and and then when, so everyone can read it and it's everything green. Uh, everyone in the team, including project manager or business analyst or your customer can understand what's going on there. Uh, there are no stranger like Selenium throws, sometimes like um, this brittle export doesn't found. So there's not nothing like that. It says that this particular stuff that is uh, uh, that using the BDD and uh, Gherkin, so everything is readable by everyone. Uh, well, now I will talk about uh, how we implemented uh, BHAT and sourceless configuration in our project. Like, uh, uh, we got uh, a start from sprint planning. We used to, uh, in sprint planning, we used to get all the acceptance criteria. Then I used to, as a tester, I used to write Gherkin, and then I wait for the developers to implement the code. Then the code comes back, uh, come to my queue. I just write some step definition to automate that feature, and that's done. So we we usually uh, plan our uh, test automation from the scratch because uh, in uh, in a specification workshop we used to have uh, we used to have a specific tasks for the test automation and fixing tests that is failing on the Jenkins. So. That works like a charm, and uh, Source Labs really help to uh, see the screenshot of the, all the pages, uh, all the steps, and the videos of the uh, test. So we can share the videos with uh, managers if something goes wrong, and uh, even if the we can send the, we, we can send the videos to the uh, customers so that they can see. Okay, thank you. All right. Last, we have David Stark giving an SE Builder demo. Ready, set. <laughs> set and a half. <laughs> set and three quarters. What comes after set and three quarters? Oh, my fractions. Seven eighths. Eight ninths. I have an old MacBook. Give you another 10 second courtesy here. For microseconds. Pentos? Seconds? Pen. Ready. Course is ready. Racer's ready. Right. Ready, so set, go. So I'm just going to give you a quick live demo of what Builder actually looks like, because um, I didn't do that in the actual talk. Um, let's try it. It can only go wrong. So um, starting up, copy of Firefox. Yeah, boom. Just pick the website. So let's just uh, recall a quick search on this. Recording Selenium 2. Let's search for kittens. Kittens are nice. Searching for kittens. We found some kittens. 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 And then let's just say, well, you know, we're going to test the search page. Let's assume we want to make sure that, I don't know, the word relevance turns up in it, whatever. So we've got our really simple Selenium 2 test. Unfortunately, we have a really ugly XPath expression in there, but never mind. And uh, we can play it back, and actually it doesn't, it claims it's not there. And indeed, it claims it's not there. Great. So that didn't work. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it again. It's always good. We've achieved a point where... Uh, Enough people looked at the uh, software at the same time that it stopped working. 
Let's try it again. Okay, so. That looks more like what it should be. Stop recording. Run this locally. Okay, that I worked. Uh, so yeah, you can record things. Um, you can then fiddle around with things. I'm just going to kind of give you a quick uh, fun of uh, different different ways you can then uh, do things with that. So you can, for example, export it to Java. Export it to Java. Let's. Um, Paste it in there. Start up somewhere. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Launch the Selenium server and uh, play it all back. Lots of copies of Firefox. Ah, oh, that, that's wrong there. Well, we can do that <laughs> one too. <laughs> so, behold, here's another test being played back. <laughs> uh, and uh, I guess we can probably even, uh, you know play back the test that we actually wanted to play back if we have enough time. We want kittens. Yeah. Kittens, right, so that worked. Um, final quick thing I want to show you. Well, I have a few seconds left. thing I'm just working on now um, obviously, you can export stuff to um, this JSON format. And if you don't want to commit yourself to some kind of language, thing which I'm working on just now um, is, well, let's do an interpreter for that. So you don't have to ever choose what language you want. You can just keep it in this, uh, in this format. You can give it to this interpreter, and it will play it back. And yeah, maybe that will even work. So that's another test again. What this test is doing, it's just going to ZBuilder and storing the title in a variable and then checking that the title is still the title. And uh, that succeeded. Okay, um, yeah, that's about it. I just want to show you. It's there, it actually works. There aren't just screenshots. And done. Mike Scott says, by the way, that I was laughing so much I had to turn myself off. So I mean, not at, but with, right? Anyway. <laughs> Mike Scott says that if you want another talk, he's kind of able to give you one. Uh, Mike Scott. Oh, is that? <laughs> he can give you another talk if you oh, want yeah. another one. Oh yeah. Time for another talk. I mean, if you don't yeah, know, that's got crazy. <laughs> Were there any names after this? No. I was the last one. All right. Oh, hey, hey, hey. Lucky you. What was the name again? Mike? Mike Scott. Mike Scott. Great. Ready, set. What's the talk title? So, let your app drive your tests. Let your app write your tests. All right, ready, set, go. Okay, this is a really condensed version of a presentation I did just recently uh, in, in Sweden. Um, uh, basically, uh, the application I was working on was a survey type application, you know, health, health app survey application. You fill in all, your, all of the answers to the questions, do you smoke, do you drink, so, um, sorry, yeah, do you smoke, do you drink, um, do you, you know, uh, how much do you eat and do you eat fatty food, yes, obviously, um, this sort of thing, and then it gives you a health profile at the end of it. The, uh, the issue with the application is, um, for any given profile, it's quite difficult to understand what question was going to be um, what question was going to be asked, 
Um, and so the, so the traditional automation in this sort of style, um, I, hey, I'll just shout. Look, look, traditional automation works like this. Do this, do that, check this sort of thing, yeah, then do something else. Oops, ah, not on this screen. Ah, right, okay. Um, quit, fail, have no idea what to do. Um, so uh, with, this, with this application, it was the, the test scripts were getting incredibly complicated. So we thought we have to drive this another way. So using sort of data driving um, type things, we worked it a different way. In this automation, um, essentially, we just had a loop going on, right? Until the end of the survey, right? Do a reverse lookup from the locator. So you look at the screen, find out what locators are on the screen, yeah? And then figure out what question that locator was for. Once you know what the question is, you then do an answer lookup given on the, for the profile of the person that you're, um, that you're, 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 you're doing the survey for. And then, give, and, then, and then find the answer. So just, uh, it was an alternative way of basically doing the, uh, uh, of doing the thing. Very, very simple. Um, we had some, uh, he said simple and then throws up a complicated diagram. Um, essentially, we had data driving it from the people, uh, people filling out the survey, um, the survey itself, uh, which had all the questions, matching the tags up, using the locators, as I say, to do the reverse lookup, and then this survey filler, which simply had this, uh, this, while, uh, this while loop inside doing all the uh, stuff. So um, I'll go, no, go, I had fitness driving it. Um, basically, um, that's the idea, just an alternative way possibly of thinking about automation, which I think operates in much more the way that we do or people do when they, when they work on a web page. It's like, you know, you don't go into Google and go, right, okay, I'm going to type into, you don't a priori go into Google and say, I'm going to type some stuff in the text box, then I'm going to press this button, then I'm going to go down to the third link, click that link, and so on and so forth. That's not the sort of thing that you, be, that you do. You just react generally to what's on the screen. You know what you want to do, which is your overall script, but how you, re how you respond to that it very much depends on what goes on on the screen. So that's the way, um, that's a, that, that was basically all I wanted to say. Maybe there's different ways of thinking about how you do, how you do web test automation. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to bring up the... Uh, so, a round of applause to all the Lightning Talk speakers. One more time. That was awesome. We have a break now, and then we're going to do the closing uh, ceremonies where uh, we'll have all the committers up and you can uh, throw tomatoes at us. That starts at 5.10, so I'll meet you back here. Is that correct? Yes. yes. All right. Go. Talk. Be free. <laughs>